This is Dr. Karen, and you are listening to the De Facto Leaders Podcast, where I help pediatric therapists and educators become better leaders so they can make a bigger impact with their services. With over 15 years of experience supporting school-age kids with diverse learning needs, I'll share up-to-date evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help clinicians, teachers, and aspiring school leaders feel more confident in the way they serve their students and clients. I'll cover a range of topics designed to help you support students' emotional and academic growth and set kids up for success in adulthood, including how to support language, literacy, executive functioning, as well as how to help IEP teams working together to support kids across the day. Whether you want to learn more effective strategies for your therapy sessions or classroom, be a more influential leader on your team, or find creative ways to use your skills to advance in your career, I've got you covered. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 114 of the De Facto Leaders podcast. I am so excited for this episode today. This is something that I stumbled upon years ago when I was still working in the school systems. So a lot of professional development is still delivered in the lecture or workshop format, even though there's evidence that this model doesn't have significant impact on student outcomes or practitioner behavior. So what do people working in K-12 education need in order to support students, change habits, and have fulfilling careers? I started asking myself that question when I was working in the schools and I stumbled upon the coaching industry. This led me to discover design thinking, a process for solving problems and innovating, which is something that I had never heard of in my pre-service training. Nowadays, people are more skeptical than ever about the scientific community. Many feel that the heavy focus on evidence-based practice ignores the human component that school professionals bring to the table. But I see design thinking as a way we can be evidence-based, innovative, and empathetic at the same time. And that's why I invited Dan Kelly from DPK Solutions to episode 114 to share how he uses design thinking to coach school leaders as well as how he's using it in the curriculum. Dan Kelly is the veteran principal of Smithfield High School in Smithfield, Rhode Island. He's an educator, instructional leader, and innovator. He served as president of the National Association of Secondary School Principals during the 2017-2018 school year and was a member of the NASSP Board of Directors for five years. He has served as a high school assistant principal, a high school and middle school special ed teacher, and a middle school math and science teacher. He was named the Rhode Island Secondary Principal of the Year in 2012. As a leader in education, Dan believes in challenging current instructional practices to provide creative and effective opportunities for students to learn, grow, and succeed. He's passionate about educational leadership that builds strong relationships with faculty in the community, utilizing social media to foster connections between educators, and establishing personal learning networks for collaboration and professional development. Make sure that you stick around to the end of the episode to learn more about where you can connect with him on social media, as well as on his website to learn more about the services that he offers for both school leaders, as well as people working in a school who want to level up in their careers. So some of the key takeaways in this episode that we discussed are why your boss isn't always the best person to coach you and where you can go to get the support you need. I found this really interesting because on one hand, we see that person who evaluates us as the person who's supposed to give us feedback on our jobs and how we're doing, but at the same time, we can't necessarily always get to the level of vulnerability that we need when we are working through challenges. So we discussed that in this episode. 
He also shares how to use design thinking to keep students engaged and provide real life project based experiences that prepare them for adulthood. So if you're interested in learning more about project based learning and how to keep students engaged in a way that also challenges them, you're definitely going to want to listen to that portion of the episode. And finally, we also discuss what school staff need in a coach and why it's different depending on your role and your career goals. There are a lot of parallels that can be applicable across roles, especially if you are someone who isn't in an official leadership position yet, but you want to be someday. But we also have to acknowledge where we are so that we can get to that next level. And we discuss a little bit about that in this episode. As I said before, stay tuned for some resources that will be mentioned during this episode that will give you more information about places that you can go to get the support you need to be more effective in your work, to make a bigger impact, and to be a better leader. So now, please enjoy this interview with Dan Kelly. Today, I am joined by Dan Kelly, a high school principal from Smithfield, Rhode Island, and you are a principal at Smithfield High School, correct? Correct. Okay, so I thought we could just start off by having you share a little bit about yourself and just your career trajectory and what brought you to where you are now. Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, for having me on. Um, looking forward to uh, to a fun conversation today. Um, so again, Dan Kelly, uh, high school principal in Smithfield, Rhode Island. I have uh, been in education now for almost, I think it's almost 25 years. Um, started out my career uh, as an elementary and special education major in the Midwest. Um, I'm a Midwest boy by heart, uh, but I've been in Rhode Island now for, for quite a long time. Um, but started out elementary, secondary, uh, elementary and special ed. And um, taught my first job was uh, uh, a middle school, and I taught uh, math and science and health at uh, Clark Middle School in Springfield, Ohio, and okay. uh, ended up moving to Michigan. Uh, one of my teammates from college said, I, you know, I got a job up here, and I moved up uh, to take a special education job uh, in a really unique situation. Uh, it was an 8-9 middle school model, and so... Um, we were doing ninth grade high school work, but in an eight, nine building, there weren't too many of those in the country uh, yeah, at the time. Yeah. And then uh, life happened, changes, find my, you know, ended up my, my wife and uh, moved to Rhode Island, which is where she was, uh, where she was located and uh, ended up finishing my master's degree. I uh, got my first admin uh, position at Cranston High School East uh, in, a, in an urban, working in an urban setting as a assistant principal for three years. And then, uh, made the jump to the principalship and uh, I've been uh, here at Smithfield now for uh, for 18 years. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to get involved with our state principals association uh, early in my career and uh, with those connections and, and that networking um, I was uh, selected to uh, be the Rhode Island representative uh, for region one for the National Association of Secondary School Principals. And so I got to go on to the board of directors uh, for NASSP, and I served there for uh, for five years. And my last year, I served as president of NASSP. And uh, that really opened up uh, a lot of doors. And uh, I got to take a year off, and I got to travel around the, the country. And um, I got to visit schools and talk to principals and talk to leaders and aspiring leaders and um, and hear the different stories about what was happening with education and leadership across our uh, across our country, and uh, it really, really opened my eyes. I just it was a great, great experience, and and came back from that and had some conversations with my state association. Said, "Hey, we got to do some work with coaching principals. Uh, we weren't offering anything along those lines for our, our first year and early career principals, and so that has been my passion project probably for the last five or six years." has been working with the state association to develop a, a program uh, to support our leaders in uh, in Rhode Island. You've done a lot of different things and I have so many different questions I could ask you. And we were talking beforehand, um, as I said, I said, we should, probably should have just turned the recording on right away when we logged on because we're both in this career exploration phase right now. 
I'm curious with the coaching because I've I've done a lot of different types of coaching, whether it be for clinical coaching or teaching methods, leadership, and then entrepreneurship. And there's all different ways you can apply it, but there's it seems to be there's it's like people use different language, whether you're doing it in one context versus another, but there seems to be a similar format. There's a lot of this whole idea of seeing yourself differently, um, changing the identity that you have first before you're going to try to get some kind of result. I'm curious what you've learned now that you've actually thought about coaching specifically and learned certain skill sets. Yeah, there it's it's a it's a fascinating process to go through. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's about people and it's about relationships and it's about developing some trust with someone and trying to get them to be reflective about their practice or their problem of practice uh, or what you know whatever their the issue they're working through. So when we first started in Rhode Island, we worked uh, we we actually did a ton of research and. Um, went out to bid to try to find a couple of different groups to, to, to train us in, in this work. And so the principal association in the state of Washington uh, did, had a great one. There was one in New Mexico. We looked at um, uh, dazzle, which is out of uh, Delaware, which we ended up um, contracting with them to do some work. And that was my first, um, my second jump into it. Cause I'd also done some work with NAESP, the elementary principal association in their coaching program. Um, then we did some work with another company out of Connecticut um, and right now, a lot of our work is with a, a group out of New Hampshire, and we're using a lot of Jim Knight's work and that, that impact coaching cycle. Um, identify a problem, learn about it, do some research, and then try to figure out a way to solve it. And so it's it's that design thinking process. Yeah. Um, that it, 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 so it is different language, but it's all the same thing. What's yeah. the problem? Reflect. Try to figure out. Try to get the the client to find their own strategy, their own way of figuring it out and then testing it and then coming back and seeing how it worked or not and start the process all over again. Yeah. That whole design thinking process seems to be, it's it's a common language in the entrepreneur world. I've heard it in the corporate world. I did not hear it when I was preparing to be in a school system. And, you know, I went through the a speech pathology program I went through a director of special ed program and I never heard that language, but it seemed to be like common sense that you would want to apply that to education. So you're seeing yeah. that in the coaching that's designed for principals or so is that yeah. more executive coaching? No, I think it's just executive coaching. I think it's just yeah. a great model to tackle any problem. And it's funny that we're kind of going in this direction in that my school, we are working on implementing a design thinking into our curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so we went through a grant process a few years ago through the uh, XQ Institute uh, in, a, in a larger grant with our state, uh, State Department of Education. And we decided to redesign our civics, our ninth grade civics program. And so we blew the whole thing up and we put design thinking into it. So it's learning about government, but you're also trying to solve a problem. And so we start off a ninth grade year with small little challenges and dilemmas, working up to a major one um, at the end of fourth quarter. That's what our kids are starting next week when we get back from uh, from spring break. And so we've got kids that are tackling everything from potholes in our town to water, you know, the, the worldwide water crisis that that we're facing. And the goal for us as a school is to have this type of process in ninth, tenth, and eleventh, and then a culminating senior project type mm -hmm. at the end. And so we're in the process of working through that. So our, we're in year two, year three of the civics program, and we're starting with biology next and starting to change that curriculum around to incorporate more of this design thinking. It makes, it gives the kids more choice and it yeah. gives them, it, a, it's a lot more relevant to them yeah. if they're trying to solve a problem that's important to them. Yeah. Well, and it seems like it would be very similar to, or it really fit right in with the whole idea of project-based learning, where you could do a lot of mini projects, and then you gradually work up to the big project at the very end. And it's yes. it's weird how it is sort of worked in. You can see parallels, like, for example, when I was in my doctoral program, I had to do all these research projects. And yes, they were very academic, but it's still 
the same thing where here's your end goal, here's your problem, and then you have to go through your process. And so it's all these mini research projects. And then at the end, you do a dissertation, which requires a massive amount of coordinating with people and communicating yeah. and developing protocols and then training people on those things. And then yeah. working with your team members to get all the information that you need. So many different things where it's supposed to build to the end. And so that's in a way that's project-based learning as well. We just don't call it that. Yep. Yep. Solving problems, working through, working through it. I mean, it, it really goes into every part, every aspect of our, of our life. Yeah. Relationships, marriage, you know, working, you know, out issues with our siblings. Um, I think it, it has a, a lot of carryover, a crossover. Yeah. And that's interesting that it's not just about how you're coaching the staff how you're coaching the principals, how you're coaching the teachers. It's also how what you're teaching the students to do. So at all levels. Yeah. And that's, that's been a big part of the, cha of the, the challenge for us is getting kids to think differently because still a lot of kids want to just be sit and be sit there and, and be talked at and be talked to. Yeah. And no, you're in charge of your learning. Here's the skills that we're trying to get you to master, but you go solve that, that, that problem that's important to you. And, and so that's a shift for kids who have been sit and get through a lot of their career. And so that's been part of one of our, our big adjustments that we've been working on. But so the, the feedback from the kids has been phenomenal once they've gone through it. And now they're asking for more courses like that, which yeah. is exciting. That is exciting. I bet, I mean, I think you could even do, you can do that at the early, the, at, at elementary school even. There's yes. ways you can do it. There's ways you can incorporate it into play. And and I think that it's it's not that we're saying we don't need those skills. Like obviously you need, numeracy skills and you need literacy skills because if you can't have written communication and you can't read things then it is going to be hard to have those basic skills to be able to apply to those other types of projects that you might be doing and we can embed all of those in yeah and you're right on like that's part of our larger goal with this is to take this concept and make it a k-12 concept and so we've taken uh, we have uh, six words in our design thinking process um and so our business kids and our art graphics to kids have been designing things to make it personalized to us. And then we're going to take those and we're going to, that's going to be our words for six through 12. And then we're going to kind of simplify that down so that we've got a consistent K through 12 design thinking kind of concept through, throughout. Um, so that's the, the larger goal. And I got to give a lot of credit to my assistant superintendent for, for, for pushing this and for pushing us in this direction. Cause it's, it's really changed a, a lot of, of our staff's thinking in a, in a positive way. So I remember I was teaching a college course um, and I did, I, I did a design thinking exercise and it, it was, um, I would say it didn't get the best response because it's just not what they were used to. They very much wanted it to be um, how they would teach it in a speech pathology program. A lot of it is, it's evaluate, treat, you know, it's just this, this model, which um, if you think about it, there could be design thinking embedded into that process as well, but it just, it, it didn't go over as well as I wanted it to just because it wasn't language that they were used to. And I, I kind of just was like, Hey, we're trying this today. I was this brand new adjunct person and trying to figure out how do I mentor these really bright graduate students who are very confident in their abilities, but also have not been out in the real world yet? I find it very different to work with people who are already in the field versus people who are in school getting, you know, preparing for the real world. That's very different. So that's a whole other topic of conversation. But when you expect to learn in a certain way, it's just... I find that even the adults want to go to that lecture model or even um, people who are out in the field, it's, you throw something different at them and it's like, wait, this isn't what I was expecting. It's, you know, I expected yeah. your PowerPoint slides and your presentation, and then we're going to take a test. Change, it's just, it's funny how people are so programmed Yeah. with the way education and it's this one size fits all model and it doesn't work for everybody. And yeah. you know, a great example, you know, going back, eight, 10 years ago was social media. Everybody hated social media. It's the end of the world. And, you know, Twitter was a, a, a four letter word and there were a lot of principles. And I was one of them that adopted it early and said, 
this is a way we can shake up. We don't have to look at just what's happening in little Rhode Island. We can now have this network of people yeah. to learn from. And it changed, it changed the ball game for me. It's really what got me probably it was a big component of how I got to be the national president was because of a network that I had built through, mm-hmm. through social media. And I can't help but wonder now is chat GPT that next big thing that's going to yeah. really revolutionize, you know, most people are like, Oh, shut it down, shut it down. Well, people said the same thing about social media and there are days I hate social media and would love to get rid of it yeah. <laughs> as a, as a principle. Um, but are there some benefits that, that, that may out outweigh things? I mean, my thoughts are I've taken almost with the whole, all of this technology, more of a, if you can't beat them, join them. It's, it's going to happen whether we want to or not, or whether we want it to or not. So I would rather be involved in the process, be involved with some kind of implementation so I can at least make sure to some extent and make the impact that I can have in just making sure that it's used for its benefits because everything has benefits and drawbacks, no matter what it is. Right. That's kind of my mindset is it's not going away. So let's just figure out the way to use it ethically. And everything is going to come with pros and cons. Yep. Yep. And we got to teach it. We can't ignore it. Yeah, definitely can't ignore it. Because the kids aren't because the kids aren't going to ignore it. (laughs) So we've got to try to stay at least one step behind them because they're they're always a few steps ahead of us, it feels like when it comes to the technology side of things. Yeah. I mean, some of the, one of the things that has come up with just uh, with so many things being digital is that a lot of the students that I would work with as somebody who's involved in special ed, if you have to think about organizing things, you need it to be very visual. And a lot of times all the things that you're processing in your head, if you can't see it, it's almost like it's not there and you can't, the way that files are organized digitally is again, it's not a folder that you can physically see. Mm-hmm. And to me, it, it's like, if you want kids to be prepared for the workforce, you do have to give them the skills that they need in order to access all of those digital tools that are being used. If you only are using paper and pencil, then you're not necessarily giving them those skills. But at the same time, I don't think we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and not use the paper and pencil planners. People have to realize, well, you know what? Some kids are going to need that in order to be able to be successful with these other digital tools over here. Or maybe we figure out a way to have different tools that do make things more accessible so that there are those accessibility features. So that's kind of my take on that, where it's, Yes, I we we do have to have an understanding of how this is impacting our students and how there might be different learning needs. But at the same time, it's not going away. We have to learn, teach people how to deal with these things and work with them. Right, right. So with your co- experience with coaching, um, and I know that you, as a principal, it's your job to mentor and coach the the teachers. And now you've been doing a lot of work with coaching principals. What things are different when it comes to what everybody needs at different in different roles or different phases of their career? Yeah, I, it's it's interesting because there's a, there's definitely a, a separation. So when I'm you know having a conversation with a staff member, I'm still the evaluator, and so it changes. It changes that relationship at the end. You know, I may not be evaluating, you know, this current school year, but in a future school year. And so being a true, uh, trying to have a true coaching model as the building leader, I is not as successful because of the role. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I try to, you know, get my staff to, to take risks, um, you know, tr- you, that, that, you know, it's okay to fail. Um, but at the end of the day, there's still that pressure to get through curriculum. There's still that pressure to, to you know, get kids to meet certain state assessments and those kind of things. Um, but that that the, the monkey in the room is that I'm still your evaluator, and that yeah. changes the dynamic of the of that of that coaching relationship. Where if I'm working with a principal and they're in a completely different district, I can ask 
difficult questions. I can, I can, you know, really attack things and get them to think about and reflect. Uh, they can be more open and honest with me about what's happening because I don't know all the players that are involved. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's something that we're, I, we've actually contracted out as a district to try to utilize outside companies to come in and do some coaching with our, with our teachers for that reason. Um, the other big challenge is as a principal day to day, I don't, I don't have time. Yeah. I don't have, there's not enough time in the, in the day to get to coaching the way I would coach a principal, you know, or somebody that was outside of, you know, outside of the building, yeah. um, you know, to get an hour during school day, just to sit down and talk about one topic. It, it, that's extremely challenging. Um, we're a district that doesn't have a lot of, we don't have instructional coaches. Um, I've got a district math coordinator um, that gets in and does some of that work, but that's one person for an entire district. And that's a position that has been asked for annually in the budget and is annually cut because it's not seen as a teacher. It's not seen as essential. And so we're still struggling to change that narrative in our district to try to show people that in coaching, instructional coaching is important. Um, even at the state level, you know, we get a lot of grants through, through a foundation here in our state to help subsidize the, the cost of, of coaching. And it is cheap. Uh, what we offer our, our, our state principals is, I think it's like $1,500 or $1,600 for 30 hours for the course of a year. Yeah, That is, is, is really cheap. You know, when you look at other uh, things across the market and we still can't get superintendents to, to put that money down because it's not seen as, as important. Wow. So a lot of our work is still promoting and trying to show the benefit of, of having a coach. And so a lot of times I'll tell my personal story of the first coach that I hired to help me figure out, um, you know, what some things and, and help me with, with my career path. And I am very grateful to, to that coach and, and, and what she did to help me uh, get me to where I'm at today. Yeah. The, the level of vulnerability that you can do with, that you can have with your boss versus somebody who is a non-biased third party, very different. I mean, yeah. That that I'm your evaluator changes the whole dynamic, and yeah. it's uh, it's 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 a, a tough it's a tough thing to to try to balance to say to teachers it's okay go ahead try it, and you know you, I've actually had to say to teachers before listen you're not getting fired it's not going to go in your evaluation go try it and see and, and try something it's okay, um, and depending on that level of trust some have done it and others have said yeah no I'm going to hold off <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I. I think there's always that difference in mindset of, I think some people are less risk averse than others. I don't know if it's more of their, their background and their experience or how long they've been in the classroom and doing their certain, the, doing the certain things that they've been doing. Do you find that like, so when you are evaluating or mentoring or doing, doing some form of coaching, however it looks for for staff or people who are your direct reports. I mean, what what are the factors that you see as far as just what makes them open to try something or open to feedback versus people who are more likely to not take your input? Um, I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, we're in the people business and it's about developing trust. And I, I think I'm in a in a better position now because I've been there for for you know close to 18 years and people know where I'm coming from and they know what I stand for and they know what I'm gonna you know back people up on and, and or, or or you know defend um, and so I think you know a lot of the work right now especially for newer teachers is you know trying to keep them out of out of danger out of hot water yeah and so you know there's there's so many eyes looking at curriculum and or resources that teachers are are utilizing um you know you're bound to offend somebody and so i found that a lot of the the coaching work that i've done informally with staff is really to help them navigate how to handle a parent or community member who was questioning the way they did something or the way they reacted something or to an article that they that they may have used that, uh, that somebody may have de determined as offensive to them uh, it is a tough, it's a tough field right now. And there's a yeah. lot of eyeballs watching and, and questioning, which is not, a, not a bad thing, but we've, I don't know if our college is 
do enough to prepare new teachers for for that. Yeah, I, I can't imagine being in a role where I have to talk about anything that has to do with politics or government. I would I think that would be a very challenging role um, just because there's so many different opinions and you want to be non-biased. I, that would be very challenging. That that's always a topic that has been a struggle for me in general, just because it there's so many different facets of the government and having to understand all of it. The sciences were always a little bit easier for me. <laughs> but but even that, I mean, just yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, you, there's, there's nothing always. that's that's safe, I guess. Yeah. Um, but the you know just the the all the conversations right now around diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, yeah. um, you know, there's. There, that gets into your science conversation really, oh, really quickly. It does, yeah. And, and, and you're a biology well. teacher, and you're trying to navigate through that. And and you've got you know three kids that are in front of you that identify in a, in a different way. Um, it, it's 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 a it's a it's a huge challenge, and it's our, our colleges and our, our preparation teacher preparation programs um, have to to make some adjustments real quick and to start having more of those conversations. Cause I, I'm not seeing candidates come out necessarily ready to, to tackle some of those conversations with, with parents. I'm going to take a quick break here and talk about a free training for K-12 therapists who want to level up in their careers and be seen as leaders in their building. One of the most powerful ways that people who are in a related service provider position can really emerge as leaders on their teams is by supporting the teachers and other staff in the classrooms. And one of the most powerful ways they can do that is by showing them strategies for supporting their students' executive functioning. That's why I created a free online training for K-12 therapists to do just that, so that you can learn how to provide social and academic support that's both evidence-based and neurodiversity affirming. Now there's good news and bad news about this free training. I'll share the bad news first. So the bad news is that this training is about 90 minutes long, and there is no way that I can share all of the strategies that you need to use as well as the implementation systems in just one presentation. As Dan and I are about to discuss in this interview, one of the most effective ways to change behavior both of others that you're coaching and yourself is to focus on the next step. So one thing at a time to get you in the direction that you're going. And that's what I aim to do in this training so you can understand the direction that you need to go, how you need to shift your thinking right now, and then I offer you next steps for those who want to learn more. So to learn more about this free training, you're going to want to go to drkarendudekbrandon.com backslash EF leadership. Again, that's drkarendudekbrandon.com backslash EF leadership. Now let's get back to the interview. A lot of the materials are going digital now. So when you think about updates to materials, it is easier in some respect to make updates to things when you're not dealing with print materials. So you don't have this textbook that's out of date because the district couldn't purchase new textbooks or something like that. I mean, t- updating a textbook takes a long time, but right. doing it digitally is is a different, a whole different animal um, for better or for worse. So I'm just, I'm interested to see how that affects things. And I don't know that, I don't know if it's going to make those types of scenarios easier or not, because there are still, you're still dealing with humans, but being able to update the materials is, is another factor that plays into all of this. We're, we're moving to, uh, so by state statute, we have to have a, an approved science curriculum in place, I think by 2025 or it's 2027. And there are no approved programs out there to even choose from <laughs> right oh now. Gosh. They can't they can't build them fast enough. And so yeah. we're even looking that. we're looking at uh, at open sciad is is something we're going to pilot potentially next year. And they only have like one unit written for the core the the three subject areas right now. Um, and and it, and they're and they're getting through it as fast as they can. But it's a that's a huge challenge for. That's a huge challenge. And so with it being open source, it is going to be neat to see how how much oversight there is going to be into, into some of those materials that might get used. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, even if you have a tech team and if you're doing things digitally, it still takes time and resources to do that, especially if um, you don't know what the approved curriculum is. Yeah, yes. And so that will be, so we, we're we in year one of a new English curriculum. We're in year three of a new math curriculum. And then next year we'll start piloting science. So there's a lot, we have a lot of change happening right now uh, in in Rhode Island, among other things, graduation requirement wise that are have, have really thrown a, a challenge to us, uh, mandating world language, mandating computer science, uh, mandating algebra two. So we've got some interesting things we've got to get in place starting with the class of 2028. Yeah. Ugh. There's a lot. So I'm curious with, so there's all of this stuff that's, yeah, we're so many different skills and things to keep up to date on. And I, with the, with the coaching conversation and dealing with things like imposter syndrome, there's a, a whole different conversation we can have about that. But with the coaching models that you have used in the past, is there a framework for dealing with imposter syndrome, whether it be a principal or a teacher? How does that fit into the mix? Um, yeah, I, I think that everybody goes through through that that scenario, that thinking um, in in their at some point early in their career. Um, I think the, the, a lot of the principals that I've worked with that are first year, second year principals. Um, they're so overwhelmed with the the management and the day to day components of everything that I'm I'm not sure they get to that <laughs> to, to the imposter syndrome maybe quite yet. Um, but when it when it comes to coaching through, it's it's trying to you know I'll, I'll start off a coaching conversation and say, all right, Karen, what do you want to focus on? What's your challenge today? What do you want to tackle? What do you want to get better at in these next thirty minutes or these next forty five minutes? And really trying to get them to focus in on that one little piece that we can try to work on to make their lives a little bit a little bit easier. And uh, with with these early career principles, a lot of it is just around load management and trying to 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 get through all of the decisions and things that are coming. So if we can get them to focus in on that on one thing and and have them come to a solution that they're going to try, then we've 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 kind of chipped away at that a little bit and 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 helped to improve them. Yeah. I, I can imagine that it would be difficult to pick one thing. I always have a hard time with that question when people ask that, where it's, I have 50 things. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's really, it's, it's really about, yeah, you got to get it narrowed down to one because you want them to walk out. I want them to walk out with a couple of resources or a couple of strategies to try going in before we, before we're going to meet again. And, and in our, in our program with the principals in, in Rhode Island, we're meeting about every two weeks in, in, in an ideal situation. So it's tough to, um, you know, we're not we're not designed in a way where we're getting a lot of daily or weekly feedback. Um, so some of the, the, the issues that we might be tackling, um, you know, might be what's affecting them for tomorrow, or it might be something larger, like we're going to talk about, you know, how to redo the master schedule. So that, you know, more kids have access to AP courses or something like that. And that might be something that we're going to tackle over multiple sessions. Um, but usually we can find find something to get them to, to to narrow down and get through for that for that that session. Yeah, I feel like whenever I'm asked that question, I always am like, can I sneak in one or two more things? I, I never want to commit to just even though I know, you know, it's counterproductive because it is yes. you you um you spread yourself thin and you don't really ever get one thing done when you're doing too many things at once. And sometimes, that's oh, sometimes sorry. that's just part, that's part, that's the, that maybe that's the question right there. Yeah. How are you delegating your work with your assistants or with your leadership team so that you don't own everything? Yeah. You know, that is, that's a common one right there. Just because we're the leader doesn't mean we own it all. We have to make all those decisions. Yeah. Um, but it's tough because at the end of the day, the buck stops with you and everything's going to go through you at the end of the day. So that that's a tough balance. It is. And we're, you know, where a lot of the, of the people that I'm working with, the idea that they can delegate is a mindset shift because they don't, a lot of the people that I'm working with, they might be, maybe they're a supervisor to the, the special ed staff or the therapist. But a lot of times, if they're a therapist, they don't technically have direct reports. 
So the idea that you might actually be able to delegate things is a shift for them. The whole idea that, well, you might have things that you want to work with, with your students, but maybe you could train the teacher to do something in their classroom that could eliminate some of the things that you're working directly on with your students or train the teaching assistants. And then the idea that if you focus on that and focus on training other people and what you do, then that actually takes work off your plate, even though there's a time commitment up front. So that's that's a shift that is sometimes difficult for people to make because there's usually some kind of an immediate hair on fire thing that seems more urgent than that, even though that that's going to actually make things better in the long run. And I think in, in my building, I think we've got a good support network where my staff or in, you know, my special ed teachers, therapists, I'm thinking about my school psychologist. Yeah. They have that, that, that power to go to the department chair and say, Hey, this isn't working for me. Can we try X, Y, and Z? And, um, and so, yeah, they may not have that direct report to, place something onto their, their table, but there are, there are other staff that we can utilize. Um, you know, even if it's us trying to get a secretary to take some paperwork yeah. off their plate mm-hmm. to free up time. Um, and so I would encourage people, you've got to ask, you've got to sit, you got to have, you got to be able to go to the principal and say, Hey, this isn't working. Can we sit and do a brainstorm in and, and try to figure out ways to put some supports in place? And I think oftentimes people are afraid to go to the principal to go say, Hey, I'm overwhelmed. They don't want to look like a failure. They don't want to look like they're, they're weak or, or that they can't do their job. Um, but I would prefer people come forward and say, Hey, this isn't working. Let's try to brainstorm. Mm-hmm. But I have that principal title. And so nobody wants to go to the principal's office ever <laughs> as a yeah, teacher, as a kid, kind of a negative connotation. Yeah. And it's, it's, and so there it is, it's a tough, it's a tough thing for some folks to, to overcome. Yeah, I've had, I think, you know, I've been pretty fortunate in my experiences with principals. I remember one of my coworkers, uh, the, it was, we're, we're at t- parent teacher conferences. This is when we we're having this conversation. So it's October. And she's like, I've already cried in Kelly's office three times this year. That's the principal where we could do that in our building. And she was really good about if there was a parent who was, we're having a challenging situation with the parent. We knew we could go to her and she was really good with dealing with that confrontation. And, and that's just, I think it really took time to build that trust with staff. So people knew that they could do that. And uh, yeah, I I mean, I think that it's not always like that. Um, I didn't ever cry in the principal's office, but I definitely remember going in there being like, listen, I got a lot going on now. I just want to let you know, that this is what's happening. And um, I hope it's not affecting my performance, but let me just share what's happening so I can give you a heads up. I think, I think post COVID I'm seeing more people coming forward saying, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling. Hey, this isn't working for me. And I'm glad. I think that's one of the positive things that's come out of, of COVID. And um, as I think people are recognizing more, they're they're overwhelmed and i've never seen too with you know with staff so many challenges outside of just their own their little teaching world and you know family members getting sick and cancer and different things it's it is it is a it's it's a lot to manage and i am amazed every day how some people come to work and keep it all together and are still making an impact on kids with all of the things they're dealing with when they leave the school doors at, at two o'clock Yeah, it's and, you know, like we we talked about social media before, and I think it maybe it depends who you follow and how often you're on and what platforms you're on. But just the the perceptions of people who don't have any background in education, the perceptions of things going on are just, you know, sometimes you see the posts and you think. I would love to just tear apart that thing that that person just said, but you know what? I'm going to go on with my day, <laughs> even though it's it's infuriating. And the problem is, is that those posts get a lot of attention because they're, oh, you know, they're what controversial and they say something that's a straw man argument or that's just clickbaity and 
it's frustrating because then it just it gets ideas out there where and people don't really know the whole context. Yeah, th- definitely positives and negatives <laughs> to the to the social media side of things. Um, you know, what's that the, the the statement if you know everybody went to school so they're all an expert on how schools sh- should be should be run. And uh, you know, there's a lot of things happening in states across our country right now involving you know whether it's you know curriculum or state impact of state testing uh there's a gentleman a former principal down in texas that i follow with and he's constantly posting stuff to push back against what the governor is is trying to uh, initiate the governor is trying to push down there so uh, i try to keep some balance I, I i follow some things on social media i try to stay focused on the people that i know are going to make me better and stronger yeah um as a leader and as a coach and um but it's 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 easy to go down that rabbit hole and uh i i i want there's also a part of me too that as a leader i want to know what they're saying so that i can be oh, yeah. proactive to attack it but it's a bad it, it, it can put you in a bad place so you, you definitely have to have a thick skin, <laughs> skin in this uh, in this teaching profession right now you do. And I, I agree with you that it is really important to know what other people are saying, but I think also just to really listen to what they're saying, because there might be something to it. I mean, there might be something where um, if you really listen to their objections, that maybe maybe you might be able to overcome them. Or, uh, you know, I think that some people are too far on one side of an argument and you're never going to be able to convince them, but there's always those people. And I think this is probably the majority of the people who are just confused and they're not really on one side of the, of an extreme, but they're just like, I don't even know what to think. I don't know what's going on, especially if they don't have an education background. I just remember, um, like when my stepdaughter, when we had the initial parent orientation they're talking about how they had to had to cut all of all of these programs because they had budget cuts. And so they had to rearrange the way that they're doing the field trips. And they're like, we really need parent volunteers. Please sign up for all of this. And um, and then there was just voting with those types of things with different initiatives that are going to affect our taxes. And um, just, again, the perception of how it comes across to people who aren't in the schools where it it sounds like they're saying, oh, well, we don't have any resources, but I'm like, yeah, but they, they're actually doing really well with the resources that they have. They're being very resourceful and they're asking for help. They're trying to find ways they can reach out to the community. And so, you know, to me, I'm like, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, vote for the thing that's going to raise my taxes. If it means that, we don't have to cut junior high sports or we don't have to cut all these extracurricular programs that are going to be above and beyond the core curriculum. And I'm a core curriculum person. I'm a literacy person. So, you know, I'm always like, you got to have the reading curriculum. You have to have that, but they can't benefit from the reading curriculum if you don't have all these other things. I mean, that's the whole point is to prepare you for those things. It's a, it's a tough, it's a tough balance. And, you know, in my town, I've, I've sat on those, those budget hearings and, and listened to, you know, the folks that are, are struggling to, to make the rent and pay the bills and, you know, a tax hike, you know, can impact them significantly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I also hear, but we all, but we moved here for the schools and, you know, our, our buildings are falling apart and I don't have old, I mean, my building is, is 60 years old which is nothing compared to some of the other buildings in, in Providence yeah. and Central Falls and other, other parts of the state that are 100 and 120 years old that are still being used. And it's, you know, nobody wants to put money into those facilities. And for years, it was just kick the can down the road. And now we're sitting here and people are upset because the, you know, the bathrooms are falling apart. Well, it's not like we haven't been telling you the bathrooms are falling yeah. apart. We've been yeah. asking for that, but it's not been a priority to invest money in, into, into capital, you know, type projects. Uh, and that's a common theme across the country right now. And now we're in a, in a crisis c- scenario where we're, we've got to make some serious investments into infrastructure, not only schools, but roads and bridges in our state as well. Yeah. And that is going to, 
it's going to have an impact on people. It's got to come from somewhere because we can't not have them. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, it is always good. I mean, if you're, you're in a position where you're educating the community, I think that where I've seen people, I don't know, maybe not handle it the way that I think it should be handled is when they get mad at people for having objections to those types of things. And I don't think you can get mad at people for have question, having questions about where's my money going. I mean, that's, if you approach it that way, you're never going to be able to get on the same page with someone. Yeah. Um, I, I think it, that that respectful dialogue and discourse, yeah. I think, has been lost a little bit in our in our country. Yeah. And, and we yeah. go right to yelling and pointing fingers instead of being able to sit down and have a, a conversation. We've we've lost that that art a little bit. And I think part of that is because of social media, because we can hide behind we can post something. And I'll say something on Twitter that I would, you know, never say to grandma. Yeah. And so, you know, we have, we have that conversation every day with a kid. Why would you say that about Johnny? You wouldn't say it to his face, but why would you put that there? And, um, but we've got adults in our communities that are doing that exact thing. So we definitely have a, a, a challenge ahead around civil discourse for sure. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it's really interesting. Um, You know, I'm, I have a, an online presence and I talk with other people who have online, you know, an online following. And it's interesting when you actually talk to people, because sometimes your impression of who they are and what they think based on their social media, when you actually talk to them and talk through some of the nuances, a lot of times it's not what you would think, or you think, oh, they, they said this about this topic in their post or in their reel that was 60 seconds long, they think this about this topic. And then when you talk to them and they're like, well, no, actually it's a little bit more complicated than that. And it's just that they don't have enough time to explain the whole thing because people have a short attention span and they're not going to listen to the whole video. Um, Or this, I have this happen to me all the time where, um, you know, I've been doing a lot with executive functioning and anxiety and that's a whole chicken or egg debate. And again, so, so many complexities to it. And I'll say something in an email and then I'll have a 90 minute presentation that it's linking to. And people will be like, what about this? And I'm like, did you listen to the presentation? And I know 90 minutes is a large time commitment, but you didn't listen to everything that I said. You just made an assumption based on this one little thing. And that happens all the time. And I do think that sometimes even in these trainings for people that where they're doing training on how to get more uh, engagement on your social media, they're always like, be polarizing, make people mad. Like they actually teach that. And um, you're not rewarded for appreciating nuance on social media at all. Oh no. Have you, have you given any thought to getting rid of some of your social media? So I have thought about, taking it off my phone or just really limiting the amount of time I am on certain platforms. I, I will always put my stuff out there. It's more about, about the amount of time that I spend on the platform. Um, And I just, I'm, I'm giving some thought to which platforms I spend a lot of time on where I'm spending a lot of time right now is LinkedIn because it's just a different vibe over there. You know, like there's, there's not as much engagement on posts. Sometimes there is, but it's definitely not as much as something like Instagram or Facebook where there's hundreds of comments. Yes, occasionally that happens, but in general, like my posts get less engagement on LinkedIn, but it's more about actual conversations with people, which you can do on the other platforms. It just, it's a different feeling over there. And there's a different group of people on that platform. So, um, I'm not to the point where I would get rid of my accounts just because of what I do. Um, It's important for me to have an online presence, but I have thought about how I show up on those platforms and uh, the way that I, the way that I do that. Um, I don't know. That's, that's always an ongoing process for me because it's, there's so much change with, Oh, this is the thing now that you got to be doing. And it's really hard to, keep up with it. Um, the one thing that I, I'm having a little bit of FOMO about right now is TikTok. I just, I can't quite get into it. 
it's yeah. I mean, you open the app and it's like in your face videos and they're loud. It's not like the other ones where you can sort of ease in and start scrolling. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I know that's that fun. that's supposed to be the the platform that you got to get on right now. And I'm just, um, I don't know. <laughs> you won't you won't see me on that one. I, I, yeah. won't, I, won't, I won't I won't go there. Um, well, according so. to the experts, you don't have to dance around to trending sounds to be successful on there. And there are ah. some school principles on there, but I, I have uh, I've seen a couple of clips and uh, my assistant principal is is very much in tune with that. And so I let her handle that part of the world and she'll update me as I need it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of more along the lines of just thinking about what am I doing right now? Am I doing something productive? Am I actually on here networking and talking to people and having real conversations? Or am I just doom scrolling? Because it is very easy to just be like, eh, let me just check Instagram and start scrolling. Oh, wait, and I was going to come back to my work in five minutes. And now I saw something that I want to comment on. And now I'm in a conversation with somebody. And it's just, it is really easy to get sucked in. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. I'm trying to figure out what, trying to kind of audit myself to, and trying to check to see. And I know there are apps that I can check to see my time on and I'm afraid to look at them. <laughs> oh, but I know. It's that know. balance of wanting to know what's happening in in the school and, and having a pulse of what's happening versus getting down that that rabbit hole. It is a, It is a tough balance for sure. Yeah. Like I said, um, I've been focusing more on just directly talking to people and doing podcast interviews so you can have a full conversation with someone and get to know them versus just commenting on your Instagram post. I saw there's there was this mean or this um, meme the other day that I saw that was like, you know how it's, oh, have you talked to so-and-so? Oh yeah, I talked to him the other day. And it's like, did you talk to them or did you like their Facebook post? Because that doesn't count. If right. all you did was just send them an emoji or something. And yeah. I have found myself getting sucked into some very bad habits with um with that, with not really talking to people. So but again, you can talk to somebody across the country. You can connect with a principal in Rhode Island and That's get right. them on your podcast that way. Completely random how that worked out. <laughs> glad, I'm glad that it did. It did. Um <laughs> All right. Well, we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, do you have any? So before we wrap up, are there any big takeaways that you have had since diving into the whole world of coaching and leadership that you think would be really good to leave leave us with here? Um, I think uh, whoever is is listening to this, whether it's a special ed teacher or a support staff leader, um, I think that you've got to start to advocate to, to, to have a coach. Yeah. Um, the world that we're in is, is getting more and more challenging to, to navigate um, in, in this educational space. And I think we as professionals have to do a better job of asking and even demanding that I have somebody to, to help me and, and support me. And um, you know, a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of larger districts that have that built in, um, but there are some pretty affordable ways, I think, that that teachers and and and, and support staff or you know anybody in the education field can go to their principal, their assistant soup, and say, hey, you know, how how can I get some help with this? How can I try to 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 get some coaching support? And I think if we can continue to push that narrative and that request, then we can we can get you know get that to happen more in our in our buildings. And I think ultimately it will it will make the teachers' lives a little bit, you know, better and, and help them improve. Um, but this can be a lonely profession, especially for yeah. principals. Yeah. Um, and so having that coach, uh, I think, can really have make a significant impact on on their success. And, and there's research to support that. You know, that early career first year principals who have that coaching and mentoring um, will stay longer. And so, you know, there's a, there's a cost savings ultimately with that for, for a district. So, but I think it's going to be upon us to advocate, to ask for that. And so I would encourage uh, anybody that's listening to, to go to their principal or, or central office and say, Hey, what can I do to get a, to get a coach? Yeah. I wonder what it is, what it's like for teachers, because there's, I mean, 
the huge exodus that, you know, that teachers are leaving. And I just, I wonder what that would do for people who are directly working with students just because the burnout is so high. And I don't yeah, think you I... can ignore the funding conversation. I mean, I think that sometimes people assume that they, that it won't be paid for just because it's, this is how much PD you get, or um, this is it, what the budget is. And there's there that's where you know in in our state principals have a lot more uh, oversight of the of their budgets and and you know everybody's got some chunk of money set aside for for PD and we started off small as a district in our PD committee and we started working with a, a company out of uh, out of Cambridge and they offer full you know you can get coaching for an entire year or you can do these like mini cycles of coaching. And, uh, you know, there you do four 30 minute sessions. And so we've, we've experimented with that in our district and we've had some really positive success with, uh, with that group and, um, have had teachers that have asked to have it over and over again. So, um, okay. we don't have a huge pot of money for it, but we're, we're able to use what we can to try to, to build and sustain some sort of coaching momentum in our district. Yeah, that's, I would have loved to have that. I mean, I, I found it in other ways. I mean, but uh, it, it would be nice to have that just front loaded and given right away. <laughs> yes. But again, we've got to advocate for it. We've got yeah. to get that into our contracts. We've got to get that negotiated. We've got to be talking about it more because um, it's just not going to, you know, we've got to show that need and that research behind it so that we can get that financial support for it. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of social media, and online, where can people connect with you? Uh, so LinkedIn is probably it, it would be uh, the first first spot. Um, I also have a website, uh, Daniel P. Kelly um, dot net. It's K E L L E Y, um, and so people can learn a little bit more there about me. Um, and again, I'm on, on on LinkedIn as well, and uh, folks can can reach out there if anybody's interested in in doing some coaching. Um, feel free to shoot an email and I uh, would be happy to talk through uh, some options. And, uh, you know, like I said, most of it is really focused on, on school leaders, uh, but uh, happy to, to communicate and connect with, uh, with anybody if they think that uh, I might be of, uh, of help and service. Great. Well, we'll link to all that in the show notes. So thank you so much for being here with me today. My pleasure. And uh, it's been, it's been a, a blast and I, and I wish you, I wish you the best with, uh, with your, with your work. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to check the show notes for all the places that you can connect with Dan. And also, if you want to learn more about how you can emerge as a leader on your team, make an impact on the way that students are supported in your building, and also help them meet their therapy goals, then check out my free online training where I outline how to provide social, academic, and emotional support at the K-12 level. To sign up for that free training, you're going to want to go to drkarendudakbrandon.com backslash EF leadership. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave me a rating or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And finally, if you would like to be a guest on the show or if you have an idea of a great guest that can speak on the topic of educational or clinical leadership, then I would love to hear from you. All you need to do is email me at talk to me at drkarenspeech.com. Thank you again for listening, and I will see you next time. <laughs>